Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, second of this year's Institute of Physics lectures at the University of Sussex. Welcome, everybody, in particular, welcome to everybody here from uh, schools and colleges around the region. So, uh, tonight, um, we have, uh, uh, this is the South Central branch of the Institute of Physics, and tonight we have a, quite a South Central speaker, uh, Tina Potter, um, who uh, grew up in Croydon, uh, did her undergraduate and PhD at Royal Holloway, uh, uh, University of London, and uh, has been a postdoctoral research assistant here in the uh, Atlas Particle Physics Group uh, at Sussex since uh, 2009. And, uh, so for the next, uh, next hour or so, she's uh, going to be uh, telling us uh, about searching for Susie at Atlas. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Can everybody hear me OK? Yeah? OK, good, good. Um, I'm going to come out the front so that I can see what I'm talking about, too. OK, so what I'll be telling you today is about um, thank you. <laughs> um, how I do my research, I'll be introducing you to the LHC, to CERN, uh, to supersymmetry and the Higgs. Um, so hopefully it should be a little less than an hour though, quite quick. So um, this picture I just took a couple of weeks ago at CERN. I was trying to get down to the cavern to get me with the Atlas detector here with a nice hard hat on. Unfortunately I couldn't get down there that week. So uh, this picture is actually taken just outside in the CERN area. This is uh, part of the CERN Museum. It's one of the old 1950s, 60s uh, bubble chambers. So technology, is, as you can see, has certainly moved on in terms of size as well. So I'll start off with a bit about me. So I work here at the University of Sussex, and I work on the Atlas experiment, which is based at CERN. As part of all my work, I spend about a week, a month, uh, sometimes more, out in Geneva to be based there and to see all my other collaborators as well. So this means that I travel a lot. Um, so I'm at CERN uh, about once a month, and I've also lived in the Swiss uh, front French border for about a year. Um, I have to travel around the UK and internationally as well to conferences. So I've been very lucky. I've been able to travel to Israel and Italy and Australia as part of my work. It's very nice, and hopefully I, I want to travel to loads of other places too. So this is how I became a scientist. I, as Mark said, I grew up in Croydon, um, and at school I really, really enjoyed physics. It was one of the few things I could actually understand and do. And so I went on to study at university, at Royal Holloway University of London. I did my undergraduate degree, and then after a little bit of travelling and spending all my money, I came back and I did a PhD in particle physics, which is on the Atlas experiment as well. And then in 2009, I was lucky enough to be offered a postdoc down here at the University of Sussex, uh, still working on the ATLAS experiment as well. So all throughout this, I've been working on ATLAS, so I've got quite a bit of experience on the experiment. Now, the work that I actually do um, is quite varied. I certainly don't sit in a lab by myself babysitting any experiments. What I do is I develop uh, new ideas and new techniques on how to search for new physics that might appear at the Large Hadron Collider. Because the experiments are so big and there's so many people, this means a lot of collaboration and coordination. I lead a team around the world searching for a particular type of supersymmetry, and this means a lot of emails, a lot of meetings, and also a lot of coffee. I might have had a bit too much tonight. Um, I write some code. I write quite a lot of code to analyse the data that's coming from the LHC. Um, now, I'm not a particularly good programmer, and I really do learn on the job. So um, if, you are, if you're familiar with coding and you enjoy that kind of thing, this kind of job would be perfect for you. I also have the privilege to uh, teach PhD students and undergraduate students um, some particle physics, so I get to transfer all of my skills. So all of this, and I hope I'll show you how much hard work it is, it's really hard work, but it's a really, really rewarding job. And Despite many uh, images of uh, physicists, I've never actually had to wear a white coat in my working lifetime at all. I think the last time that I did was all the way back in school in chemistry. So we'll start from the very beginning, all the way back at the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe. So we think the universe started from a, a single point and expanded into what we see today. 
We're not too sure what happened at the beginning of the universe, but we know what happened a bit later on. We had some particle flowing around, and then we had atoms forming. And then after the atoms formed, we had our galaxies forming and planets. And this is us here today, 15 billion years later. So what we do in particle physics is we try and learn about particles. And if we push particles to higher and higher energies, what we end up doing is actually recreating the particles and the conditions that are around in the early universe. And by studying them and uh, understanding them, we can start to uh, infer what happened way back um, in the very early universe. So right now, the LHC is the highest energy particle collider in the world. And this is colliding particles at around 40, well, 8 or 14 TeV, hopefully 14 TeV soon. And this takes us right back to uh, 10, well, 10 to the minus 10 seconds. So 1 followed by 10 zeros, 1 over that. So a very, very tiny sec uh, part of a second after the Big Bang. So this is what we're trying to probe now and try and answer some of these uh, questions that we have about the early universe. So high energy means going back in time. That's why we call it the Big Bang machine, or sometimes some people like to refer it as looking back at the early universe. So this is our, our usual atom. I'm sure especially uh, the, the people from schools here will be very familiar with this. What we do in particle physics is we, uh, we try and understand the fundamental particles and their interactions. So if we start off with an atom, we have a nucleus with electrons orbiting it. And the electrons are fundamental particles, very, very tiny. We don't think they're made up of anything else. But the nucleus is made up of other things. It's made up of protons and neutrons. And these are actually made up of things themselves called quarks. And quarks, we think, are, as far as we know as well, these are fundamental particles. So we've got our atom with a nucleus, protons and neutrons, and even those are made up of things called quarks. And it's this kind of level that we're trying to understand. We're trying to understand these fundamental particles and how they behave. So this is the standard model. There's a lot of particles in it. It's also called the particle zoo sometimes. And it contains all of the particles that we know about today. We've got six types of quarks, ups and downs, charm and strange, and top and bottom sometimes called truth and beauty. And it's these ups and downs that make up protons and neutrons. These other ones are quite heavy. We can make them in high energy collisions, but eventually they decay back down to ups and downs. We've also got another six type of particles called leptons. I hope everyone's familiar with the electron. And the electron has a heavier brother called the muon and an even heavier one called the tau. And all three of these have their associated neutrinos as well. These are very ghostly, uh, neutral particles. So these 12 particles, the quarks and leptons, make up all of the matter in the universe. In fact, just the up and down and the electron make up all of the atoms in the universe. Out of all of these particles that we know, it's just these three. And then we've got four bosons here, which are force carriers. So we've got the photon which is responsible for the electromagnetic force. I hope everybody's heard of photons. And that's light, essentially. And then we've got W and Z bosons, and these are responsible for the weak force, so things like radioactive decay. And then we've, finally, we've got the glue on here, and that's responsible for the strong force. You can think of it like the glue that holds uh, the up and down quarks together inside a proton or a neutron. It's very strong. That's why it's very hard to split the atom. And then finally, and I'll be talking a bit more about this, we have the Higgs boson, which is responsible for mass generation. It's responsible for all of these having the mass that they have. And this is one of the LHC's main goals, to try and understand the Higgs boson and find it, of course. So each of those particles in the standard model actually has an antiparticle. It's usually exactly the same mass. Sometimes it can be its own antiparticle. But for example, the electron has an antiparticle of the opposite charge called the positron. 
So in that picture I showed in the last slide, we've actually doubled now the particles in the standard model just by including antimatter. And we try and understand the difference between the matter and the antimatter. There's very tiny, tiny differences in how they behave. And that's why we have some leftover matter in the universe and it didn't just all annihilate us back into nothing. And we have an experiment at the LHC called LHCB which tries to understand these tiny minute differences between matter and antimatter. So let's move on to CERN. So CERN and the Large Hadron Collider in particular is one of mankind's biggest experiments in history yet. There's 10,000 scientists all coming together on the LHC experiments and to build it coming from 80 different countries. So it's a really, really huge experiment. And along the way, um, we've created quite a few technologies, like the web and touch screens. I've included a picture here of some of the first touch screens that we were using at CERN back in the, the 70s, I think it was. We've come a, a long way now with our mobile phones, which have the touch screens and the web for sure. And then also, because we need uh, a lot of imaging technology, uh, we've pushed that forefront as well, which has helped uh, the PET and MRI uh, te technology Im improvements in uh, hospitals. So it's not just uh, trying to smash things together for the sake of it. So we smash things together at really high energies, and it's important to understand why we do that. So. If you want to look at something really, really tiny, like uh, atoms or molecules, you need to look at them with very, very short wavelengths of light. And then also, if you want to look at really heavy particles, you can take Einstein's uh, equation of E equals mc squared. So if you want to create something really, really massive, you need to put in a lot of energy. So if we want to produce high mass particles, we also have to move to really high energies, and really high energies. So we smash the protons together at the LHC. So the protons are made up of uh, I've lost my beam. two up quarks and a down quark. We take a beam of protons and then another beam of protons, and we speed them up around our um, around our huge collider to almost the speed of light. That means really high energies. And then we smash them together and we see what comes out. We sometimes can produce lots of new particles, hopefully interesting, heavy, exotic ones that we want to look for. And these fly out in all directions and they leave signals in some very specialized detectors that I'll show you about. So this is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Uh, this is just a red line drawn on top of a photograph. It doesn't appear red in real life. <laughs> so this is Lake Geneva here and the Alps. It's a really, really pretty area to work. And then this is the airport. And then just here, if I'm getting this correct, is our, our main site that we work on uh, called Mayran. So this actually stretches from Switzerland all the way into France, and it's 17 miles in circumference. It's absolutely huge, and it's all underground. Now that's about as big as the circle line is in London. It's absolutely massive. So it's based underground, and we have basically the, the protons are accelerated around this ring really fast, and then some in the other direction. And they are brought to collide at four different main points. And this is where we've basically dug out massive caverns and built huge detectors to try and understand what's flying out of these high energy collisions. We've got uh, the compact muon solenoid experiment. Um, that's a general purpose detector. We've got ATLAS, which is my experiment, another general purpose detector. We've got two of these so that we can cross-check results and we can, uh, so if someone finds something, we go to the other experiment and see if they've seen it too. We've got LHCB over here. Um, that's the one that tries to understand the tiny differences between matter and antimatter. And then we've got ALICE. Um, ALICE is specifically designed um, for when we collide lead ions together. Um, they're trying to understand uh, different types of matter when this is happening. Uh, I think it like, 
quark uh, plasmas they're trying to understand. But ATLAS is my experiment, and lucky for me, it's based right next to the main site. <laughs> I don't have to drive across France. So this is our main site, uh, point one. So all of these buildings here, and they also stretch down here, is the Mayran site. If anybody's ever been or is going, you usually get off the tram here and go into the reception and all the coffee and nice bits over there. And then Atlas is just over the road. It's 100 meters underground, underneath this building. So when we need to go and do shifts and babysit the experiment a bit, we just pop over the road. Uh, this little town is Saint-Genis, that's where I, I lived for a year in uh, 2007 as part of my PhD studies. So I only had to walk a short way into work. So this is the Atlas detector as it was quite a few years ago. So this is as we were building it. These gigantic things here are magnets for our muon systems. And I don't know if you can all see, but this is a person here. <laughs> Absolutely massive. So this actually made the front page of the Times and I think of quite a few other papers as well. It's an extraordinary <coughs> photograph. So as I say, we were still building it. So the beam lines, the beam comes through there, basically will hit you in the face. There's another one coming the other way. And they should collide right in the center of the detector. Now we've actually filled this entire space it's not such a good photograph anymore. We filled the entire space with complex technology to try and see the particles as they spray out through our detector. To try and get an idea of the size of it more, this is a five-floor building at CERN. Another nice place to get coffee. Um, <laughs> this is our Atlas detector here, this red one. It is 25 meters in diameter and is about 7,000 tons. It's absolutely huge. If you do get a chance to go and see it, it, it's really quite extraordinary. Our competition, the CMS, the Compact Muon uh, Solenoid, is much smaller. It's only 15 meters in diameter, but it's much, much, much heavier, hence the name Compact. It's 12,500 tons. So CMS would sink and Atlas would float on water. So our detectors, we build them like onions, essentially. This is another view of our Atlas detector. And so you've got one beam coming in here and the other beam coming in here. And we bring them to collide right in the center of our detector. So they're spray the particles will spray out in all kinds of directions. So we need all these different layers to take into account um, all the different particles that we want to see. Now, we smash the protons together at a really, really high rate. The events, the kind of events that we're trying to, to see and record is something like 40 million per second. Now, we can't write that much data to disk. So what we have is a really clever um, hardware and software system that picks out the interesting events that we want to analyze later. It really discards some of the, the boring ones. And that takes us down to record just 400 uh, events per second. So our first layer is an inner detector, uh, yes, the inner detector which sorts out all the tracking and detects all the charged particles. And then we've got two layers of calorimeters. I'll explain what they do in a minute. They essentially measure energy. And then the rest of this huge system is to measure muons. So this is another cutaway of the Atlas detector to try and explain why we need all these different layers. So we've got three layers of tracking systems, and two layers of calorimeters, and then the muon spectrometer. So the tracking detects charged particles like uh, electrons and muons, anything that's positive or negative, and it can't see anything that's neutral. So uh, a muon can be detected, an electron, but a photon, the dashed line means it's not detected in that bit. And then we build a layer of calorimetry, and what this basically does is stop particles, stops them almost dead in their tracks, and then measures the energy that's dumped into their systems. The electromagnetic one uh, can measure uh, photons and electrons, but then things like protons and neutrons have much more punching power 
and they need an extra layer of calorimetry to really stop them. So that's what the hadronic calorimeter is. And finally, muons have lots and lots and lots of punching power. They actually escape our detector. So what we did, we've built another layer of basically tracking systems to see if there was another track left, and then we can say that that was a muon that made it all the way through there. That's why all these different layers are needed, so that we can tell the difference between a muon, a photon, an electron, and a proton. And there's a lot of technology that goes into all of these different layers. So if you're interested in hardware, this is a, a good um, area to be in. So we, we, we um, started up the Large Hadron Collider in 2008, and it was a really big event. We started circulating the beams, everything was going really well. Uh, the BBC had a, a big bang day, Google changed their, um, their front page as well, everyone was extremely excited. And it went well, but then we had a little technical fault because it was built by people. And um, what happens is we, uh, one of our magnets quenched and basically heated up a lot of liquid helium, which uh, basically went into a gas really quickly, so it was a bit like an explosion without any fire. But that broke quite a lot of our uh, collider, unfortunately. Basically, one of these huge magnets moved quite a lot. So it actually took about 14 months to repair the Large Hadron Collider and also to make sure it didn't happen again. Because, I mean, we, we didn't want to shut down for a year. We wanted these proton collisions. We wanted to look and see what we could see. So we started again in 2009 and everybody was very excited that we were going to create a black hole and destroy the Earth. <laughs> we didn't, of course we didn't. Um, we don't really have the energy um, to do that kind of thing with the LHC. So we didn't create any Earth-destroying black holes. In fact, everything worked quite nicely and we saw things like this. Now this is a, rep, uh, a reconstruction of what happens when we collide the protons in the middle of our detector and all the particles spray out. Now because we're colliding protons, it's a bit like throwing bags of marbles at each other. It's really, really messy. So there needs to be quite a lot of understanding to try and see if there's any, anything interesting going on in all of this mess. But we've, we've developed some nice solutions. We have some great software that can clean up our events basically to something like this. So what we can do is remove all of the low energy noise and try and just pick out the high energy, possibly interesting stuff. So this is a picture of a Higgs going to four muons. And now it's much easier to try and pick the muons out. There's not quite so much mess. So what do we look for? Obviously the Higgs, and we found the Higgs, and there was a, a nice Nobel Prize given to some of the, the theoreticians this year. Um, so we look for the standard model. We see the standard model, a lot of it, um, and we try and make some really precise measurements of the standard model, because we're doing this at a really high new energy that's never been done before, so we want to see what the standard model will look like at these high energies. We look for the Higgs, and we found the Higgs. Um, I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. And we're also looking for anything else that could possibly come up. So there are some theories that say we could create some very tiny miniature black holes, I mean very, very tiny, that might disappear in a puff of radiation. There's theories uh, that think that we might be able to detect extra dimensions <coughs> that might be really curled up. We can't see them in everyday life, but because we're probing such high energies and such small distances, we might start to see some signs of them. Supersymmetry, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. And also there's theories that predict even more Higgs bosons, not just one. We could have a whole string of them. And there's much, much more. I mean, there's, there's massive groups, um, even just within the Atlas experiment, dedicated to looking for uh, new physics, not just the standard model. So I'll tell you about the Higgs boson, since it's uh, extremely popular and we uh, 
and the Nobel Prize was, was given to the uh, prediction of the Higgs boson. So basically about 50 years ago, all the theoretical calculations only worked if the standard model particles were all massless, which is not great because experiments say that most of them actually have mass. We know the electron has mass. We know the quarks have mass. These are really quite massive, the W and Z bosons. And the neutrinos have a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of mass. So in typical particle physics fashion, somebody invented a new particle to explain what we didn't know. And so the Higgs particle, the uh, Higgs boson, was um, basically thought up to give the particles the mass. And the way this works is that light particles interact with the Higgs only a very small amount. So the electron's quite light, doesn't interact with the Higgs very much, but just a small amount, and that's why it's light. <coughs> its big brother, the tau lepton, that's much heavier, and it interacts with the Higgs quite a lot, and that's what gives it its heavier mass. The photon we know is actually massless, so is the gluon and they don't interact with the Higgs at all. So suddenly we have uh, an idea about how mass is generated, where it comes from, because we didn't really have a clue before. And of course, we found the Higgs, and I'll show you a quick, uh, simple idea of uh, how we found the Higgs. So even though we're colliding the protons at really high energies, it doesn't mean we're going to suddenly create thousands and millions of Higgs. It's actually quite a rare process. It might only happen maybe one in 10 billion events. But if we can create the Higgs, it will decay something like this into two Z bosons, and each of these decay into an electron and positron pair. Now, there's also a lot of standard model background where you could just create the ZZs and decaying into four electron positrons. So there wasn't, say, there's not a Higgs there. So it's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. There's going to be standard model processes that happen much more often and that might completely drown out a signal like the Higgs. So what we need to try and uh, understand is the haystack. If we can understand the haystack really well, map it really well, we can try and find that tiny, tiny needle within it. And we can try and get rid of a lot of the haystack as well to make it more likely that we'll find our needle. So this is one of the, the main channels that we found the Higgs in. So what we did is we had a look at four lepton events and we tried to discard everything that looked like the standard model processes. And we plotted the mass of these four lepton events, which should give us the particle that they came from. Now this red curve here. This is our good old standard model Z boson, centered around 90 GeV, exactly where we thought it was. And as we took more and more data, we started to see another peak coming up here, and everyone got extremely excited about this. And it actually fits very well with our, our Higgs prediction at around 125 GeV. We didn't know quite what mass it would be. We knew that it wasn't anywhere down here. We knew that it wasn't anywhere up here. So we knew that if it was going to appear, it should be roughly here. So we found the Higgs boson, which was absolutely excellent. Everybody had a, a lovely big party. Um, and we measured it to be about 125 GV. So this is one of the, the, the biggest discoveries, actually, of the... Uh, in particle physics for a very long time. But what happens? So how do we know that we definitely saw something? How do we know that it's not just a fluke or an error in what we did? What if it was just a fake? So what we try and do is we try and calculate the probability that the standard model can fake a signal like this, just to be sure. I mean, we, we can see a nice peak there, but what if it was just a fluke? What if it was a fake and just a statistical aberration? So we can calculate the probability that this could happen. I won't go into all the details of it, but this curve here goes down very, very far to what we call very high sigma. And it came out to be something like a six to seven sigma um, 
signal, essentially. And this means that we're super, super confident that it's not a fluke. It's actually the chance of it being a fake or a fluke is actually the same as, say, throwing 25 heads in a row or more. And you can sit down and try and do that if you like. So we're absolutely sure that we've definitely discovered something brand new, and it's very, very exciting. We have to ask ourselves a few questions. We know we've discovered something new, but is it the Higgs boson? I don't know if you saw in the news for quite a while, we were calling it the Higgs-like boson. And this was a bit of a political move because we had to measure a few more properties to see if it looked and smelled like the Higgs boson that we predicted. Luckily it is, and uh, we're all happy enough that it looks like the Higgs that we can now call it the Higgs boson properly. No more Higgs-like. There's a few more properties that we need to measure to absolutely pin it down, but we need a bigger data set. We need to take more collisions. We need more data to really pin down the final things, but we're pretty confident that this is the standard model Higgs. And now we've discovered it, it actually means a whole new era in particle physics. There's the discovery of the Higgs actually throws up a lot more questions about the standard model and gives us a lot of hope that there's actually something new further to discover. So I'll start off with one of the major problems of the standard model. This is the, uh, the universe as we know it today. A lot of it is something called dark energy, almost 70% of it, and that you can think of as the, the driving force behind the expansion of the universe. It's why the universe doesn't gravitationally collapse back in on itself. We don't know what this is, so please don't ask me. <laughs> but we do know that ordinary matter, galaxies, stars, matter that you, you know about, and we so quarks and leptons in the standard model, this actually only makes up 5% of our universe. We know that 27% of it is matter, and we're going to call it dark matter. It's very, it's very shady. It doesn't like to interact with anything. And we have really not much idea what it is. The standard model particles that we try and fit into that piece of the puzzle don't work. So we have two major questions about our universe that the standard model cannot solve. What is dark matter, dark energy, I'm not going to deal with today. <laughs> so the standard model can't explain dark matter. And also, I don't know if you, you noticed when I was talking about those three forces in the standard model, there was the electromagnetic, the weak and the strong, and I said nothing about gravity that we are all a bit more familiar with. We can't incorporate gravity into the standard model either. So there's actually quite a lot that we don't understand. So if we have a look at the sort of energies that we're probing here, so about 100 times the mass of the proton, we've probed the standard model here, and it's been perfect, it's been accurate. All of our theories uh, have been experimentally verified, and it's great. When we start to move a bit above, the standard model kind of breaks down. <laughs> All of our, our theory starts to give us uh, some infinities. Um, so we're not quite sure what's happening here. But then when we get to really high energies, uh, the theorists really come in um, and we think at something, something like 10 to the 16 times the mass of the proton, proton. all of the forces unify. Uh, they all look like each other, and we call that grand unified theories. And then at 10 to the 19 times the mass of the proton is sort of the top energy that we can get to. It's called the Planck energy. And at these energies, um, we have uh, theories of quantum gravity. So gravity starts to come in here. But there's a huge, huge desert here where we actually have no idea what could happen. The standard model doesn't seem to work. And so what we try and do is invent theories, and it's the usual thing of inventing new particles to try and fit our, our missing pieces of the puzzle. It's always worked in the past. It worked with the Higgs, it worked with a lot of the leptons and, and the quarks as well. So we think that there could be new physics, new particles that we haven't seen since way back in the early universe. Things like maybe supersymmetric shadow particles, and these, if they're populating the desert, they could, we could actually start to see some of these at the LHC. 
and if stuff does start to appear, we can start to rework our theories and understand what happens in this huge void here that we have no idea about. So this is a quick look at supersymmetry. As I said, we like to introduce particles to, under, to, to uh, fit the missing gaps in our knowledge, and this is a, a very typical one. What we do is we, <clears throat> we predict that there's going to be a particle for every standard model particle, a brand new one, and it's going to be a heavy supersymmetric particle. And we think it's going to be heavy because simply we haven't seen it at the light masses that we already know so much about. So we've got our six quarks, and now we've got six squawks. We've got some great names for these. Uh, so we've got a stop and spottom and a scar charm. I can't even say most of these. <laughs> and then we've got six leptons, which are the supersymmetric particles for our leptons. So we've got selectrons, smuon, and stau, and the snutrinos. So here, these were all called fermions. They were, these are our matter particles. But then when we have their supersymmetric partners, they're actually bosons, and we call them sposons. And then, just like you've got these bosons in the standard model, you've got fermions for the supersymmetric particles. So the partner of the gluon is the gluino. And then instead of the photon and W and Z, you've got charginos and neutralinos. So this is giving us like loads more to look for, not just these few standard model particles. It's almost doubled our, our particles <coughs> to look for. And also something that Susie does is predict lots more Higgs. The lightest one would be our standard model-like Higgs. We also start to... Um, possibly have four more uh, Higgs particles to look for as well. Now the big thing is that the lightest Susy particle, it's usually neutral, it's usually this lightest uh, neutralino here. And the really good thing about it is that it's stable, it's really heavy, it's electrically neutral, and it doesn't like to interact very much. We call it weakly interacting. And this actually means that it's a perfect dark matter candidate. We could be looking at a universe where 27% of the matter, 27% of our universe, could be the lighter supersymmetric particle. So it's really important that we start to try and look for the supersymmetric particles at the LHC and try and pin down what could be there, because it could be making up the bulk of the matter in our universe. So I'll take you through my favourite Susie search. So this is what I look for. I look for supersymmetric particles being produced at the LHC and what they might look like in, the, um, in those messy events that we're looking at. So this is one of my favourite ones that we're, we're working on now. We, in our proton collisions, we'll make a chargino and a neutralino, and then they'll decay to the lighter Susie particle, that's our dark matter particle, and some electrons, and the chargino will decay to an electron, a neutrino, and another dark matter particle. And the thing is, because we're, we're trying to make things that are really massive, it's quite difficult, and they're quite rare. And we can have some standard model events that look really, really similar. So we could have and we do have a lot of this, the W and Z production. And, you can, and it's really quite common compared to our rare Susie that we're trying to look for. So we're looking for this tiny needle in this rather large haystack here. But there's some things that could be different about these events. So let's have a look at these. I've ringed some particles that are actually invisible to our detectors. So neutrinos here... They fly through our detectors, they need very specialised detectors and a lot of time to try and observe neutrinos. So we, we're working up much tinier timescales of uh, trying to record uh, 400 events per second. So uh, we don't really have time to build detectors to detect neutrinos. So these fly through completely undetected, they're like ghost particles. 
And so are our dark matter particles, actually. They fly through. I mean, that's the whole nature of them. We need uh, very weakly interacting, ghostly-like particles to make up the dark matter in our universe. Otherwise, we'd be able to detect it a bit more. So the difference between these is that the Susy one here, I mean, they've all got three electron positrons flying out. But this one, as well as the neutrino, is going to have two dark matter particles flying out. But what can we do with that if they're invisible? Now, it's not too technical, but <laughs> essentially when we look at our events in our detectors, this is like a cross-section of our detector, we can pick up the three electron positrons, we can detect those, that's fine. But the other three ones, the neutrino and the two dark matter particles, are going to fly out completely undetected. But we can infer the, their presence. We, can, we know that they're there due to an imbalance in the energy. It, it's simple energy conservation. One of the foundations of physics. You can't create or destroy energy. So it's a bit like an unbalanced seesaw here. We know that something must have... I've drawn them in red, but they're invisible. Something must have flown out this side to conserve energy, to keep it balanced. Now, because the standard model, that process I was showing you, only had one small, very light neutrino escaping, when we measure lots of events and they're missing energy, we actually find they've got quite small values. But because the SUSY has two escaping dark matter particles is going to lead to a greater imbalance in our events and so a greater uh, missing energy. So if we had a SUSY signature, it should show up at high missing energy values. So we're hoping to see like a bump from the standard model and something exciting happening at high missing ET. So this is what we saw. This is in one of our many, many, many channels that we look for SUSY in. This is our analysis here. This plot was made by one of our students here at Sussex. And uh, it's been made public and, and shown at conferences. So this red line is the, the standard model background that we, basically our haystack that we were looking for SUSY in. This black dashed line it's what we think one of our SUSY scenarios could look like. So the standard model kind of falls away, doesn't have much happening at high missing energy values, but SUSY should give us something a bit more exciting happening at the high missing energy. Now the black points are the data, what we took from the LHC. And so th this is what happened inside our detector um, and, and what we measured. And you can see that it actually lines up very nicely with the standard model. So unfortunately, so far in this channel, we've only seen the standard model. But maybe with more data, with higher energy, we can start to see a bit more. So we haven't seen any signs of SUSY, not just in that channel that I was showing you with the three leptons for the Chargino neutralinos. We haven't, we've been looking across many, many hundreds of different channels. And unfortunately, we haven't seen any signs of SUSY. So does that mean it's not there? Does that mean the theory's wrong? We can't say that SUSY's definitely there yet, but we can start to sort of pin down what it doesn't look like. So we can use the data to feed back to theorists about what, what the non-observation means. So this is a really simplified kind of uh, look at a supersymmetry theory. And what we can say is that if, it, if we were producing the charginos and neutralinos, like in that diagram, it should have shown up. And all of these kind of, uh, all of these masses with the charginos and neutralinos, all the way sort of beyond, lower than 600 GV, should have shown up. So we can say that the, if we, they are being produced, they're being produced at such low rates because they're too massive. But if they were 700 GeV and they were in our data, we couldn't say anything about them. So that's still open. So we need to, to try and access these higher masses. It could also be hiding in really awkward places. There could be some very difficult searches for us to try and do in these messy LHC events. So we need to try and refine our searches. And also, we need to sit down and consider, have we really looked everywhere? Or have we just looked for the easy stuff? 
So there's all these things that we can still do with the data that we've already collected. But there's one main thing. If the SUSY particles are a little bit too heavy for the energies that we were colliding at, so we were colliding at the last run at 8 TV, 8 tera electron volts. What we're going to do in 2015 is collide them at 13 TV. So we're almost doubling the energies. That gives us access, for, so more energy means that we can start to access higher masses. So example, if we were, if there was a gluino that was about two and a half TV heavy, we should start to see about 6,000 times more of them than we could have with 8 TV. So it's really important when we switch on in 2015 to get this higher energy because it means that we have much more sensitivity to the higher masses and we can start to say much more about SUSY and maybe even see it if it's there. So this is a quick view of all the SUSY searches at Atlas that we've got. As you can, each one of these lines, don't worry about reading it too much, <laughs> each one of these lines is a different search. So there's hundreds of people working on this, working really hard to try and look for it in all these different channels. So far, as I said, we've only seen the standard model. So we can start to say something about what Susie isn't. So these searches at the top look for gluinos and the squawks. And because we expect them to be produced uh, at quite high rates, we can set really high limits. So we know that because we haven't seen anything, the gluinos and squawks must be over a TV or so. They must be really quite heavy. And then we've got dedicated searches for the stops and the spottoms. Some theories think that they should be produced quite abundantly. Now, this is a more difficult kind of search. As I said, things can be a bit awkward for us to look for. And so we're not quite ruling them out at a TV here, but about 600 GV, we know that we haven't seen them if they were at masses below that. And then we've got searches for the charginos and neutralinos. These are my searches. And we can exclude again up to around 600 GV based on what we haven't seen. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of everything we've done. There, there's even more searches that haven't made it to this plot. Um, some of the, the blue ones here were still using the old 7TV data that we had. The dark green ones haven't updated to the full data set as well. So hopefully soon we'll have everything in light green and be able to uh, maybe even discover something in the other channels or say something about even higher mass uh, SUSY particles. Okay, okay so now I, I come to the end. So even if I haven't convinced you that SUSY is a, a great and viable theory, it does at least give us a really rich array of particles to look for at the LHC. So it's providing a lot of answers to the standard model problems. In particular, it's got that really good dark matter particle. That lightest neutralino could be making up 27% of our universe. We think that there should be some kind of new physics turning up at the LHC, at these energies. There should be something to try and plug in the holes of our, our understanding. We're at these energies, so we hope to be accessing these new heavy particles, whether it's SUSY or maybe something a bit more exotic. But it's quite difficult to search in these massive haystack of the, the standard model processes. Some of the searches can be really quite difficult, and we're starting to get into some of those more awkward ones now. So we haven't seen any signs yet, but what we can start to do is look for the more awkward scenarios, and when, when we've got the higher energy in 2015, we can start to really probe the higher masses. So we've still got another run to do, and, and actually the LHC is going to be around for a very long time. So do stay tuned for more results. We, we've already discovered the Higgs. We really hope that we can discover something new in these, in these events. And also, because the LHC is such a big experiment, it took a long time to build. There's a lot of expertise in there. If you're considering a career in science, there's a lot of different aspects that you can be working on, whether it be hardware, software, uh, core physics, theoretical physics as well. This is all very interesting, so if you do want to work on the LHC, it will be here to stay for the next few decades. Thank you.
much, Tina, for a really interesting talk. And I'm sure that Tina uh, will be happy to take questions. And we have plenty of time, so if you've got a question, yes, you just hand with the colleague I'll speak to. Me? Yeah. yeah. A colleague asked me to ask you this. He's not here, so it's a daft question. <laughs> the standard model <clears throat> uh, does produce a masses. So the question is, how do you calculate the masses of particles in the standard model? Is it done by uh, empirical means or other techniques? Do you mean how do we measure them, or how yes. do we? Um, ah, so as they travel through our detector, I go back. As they travel through our detector, we uh, bend. Yes, we bend them using magnets. Now, charged particles can, will bend in a magnetic field. And the amount of bending gives us, if we measure the arc of its bending, tells us how fast it was traveling and it tells us how massive it is, simply by measuring, measuring the momentum. So I'm sure a lot of you are uh, doing momentum uh, calculations as part of your A-level, so momentum is very important at the LHC. It's what we measure. And so if we can measure how much it bends, we can measure its momentum, we know it's how fast it's moving from the track that it leaves, and we can get its mass. And before the uh, uh, LHC, you were able to do that with other equipment as well? Oh, yes. So the, the photo I had on the, uh, the front page was actually a, a very old bubble chamber. So when part charged particles traveled through, they used to create little bubble tracks. And so they used to, again, measure how the particles, how fast they moved, and how much they bent in magnetic fields, and their masses. Um, yeah, I'd just like to try and clear something in my mind about the Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. Does it actually just exist in the Big Bang and in the collisions, or is it locked into, into matter, into all matter? So the fact that we measure masses and we all have mass today is because there is, whether you want to think about the Higgs as a particle or as a Higgs field that the particles are interacting with, it's throughout the universe right now, which is why everything still has masses. So we're permeating. Yes. It's a fact of the universe now. <laughs> oh, okay, so two questions up at the back. So the person that's nearest me, uh, <laughs> I don't know who you are. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. So that we measure the Higgs mass as like 125 GeV, which means that the Higgs must interact with itself. It's exactly so. The, the Higgs self interactions, the amount that it plays with itself, basically gives it the mass that we have. Yeah. Can you uh, speak up or I'll, I'll it's, um, She asked if, if it's possible to have an antiparticle for the Higgs. Oh, Was that right? Yeah. yeah. So um, with a lot of our particles, their, if I can get to it, a lot of their antiparticles are themselves. So the gluon, its antiparticle is a gluon. So if two gluons collide, they can annihilate into pure energy. That's essentially how we define it. Uh, same with the photon, it's antiparticle of itself. The W is charged, so there's a plus and minus, so that, that's that one. And the, the Z as well is its own antiparticle, and we believe it's the same with the Higgs. So because it's not charged, it's, uh, I mean, and we've only just started measuring its properties, we believe it's its own antiparticle, so we might not be able to see any, any differences between a Higgs and an anti-Higgs. Question up here. Very small amounts. Very, so if you create a positron, and if you, I mean, it's super difficult to try and confine it, but it will annihilate with, the, if you put it in a container, it will annihilate with the container's edge really quickly. Um, so nobody's really storing huge amounts of antimatter. What we can do is create a small beam of it, so in PET scanners and such like, um, but nobody's really got containers of it or anything like that. <laughs> Very difficult to store. Of the yeah, essentially, when we create it, we it's only around for a short time before it starts annihilating with parts of our detector, and that's the signature that it leaves essentially with the annihilation, it gives it a little puff of light, and that's how we measure it. 
So we did, in the very early universe, have the same amount of matter and antimatter, that they were created equally. But because of the small differences, matter, whether you want to call it matter or this is antimatter, <coughs> won out in a very, very sub-percent level, and that's why we're all here. It's just chance. <laughs> Guys in holes in the ground detecting neutrinos. Um, why wouldn't they see your neutrinos? So there, are, no, this is a really good question. So there, there's these huge experiments um, underground, um, massive detectors, the size of this room, filled with heavy water, and they sit there for years and years and try and collect a couple of neutrinos. And there's the similar experiments that are looking for the dark matter as the Earth moves through the galaxy, we should be moving through a, a sort of wind of the dark matter. And so they're sitting there trying to uh, detect tiny signatures of the very, very rare interactions that they might get. Now all of these experiments for the last many decades haven't found anything. So they've been able to say something about the nature of dark matter because they haven't found it. So theirs are direct experiments, and then we're trying to detect it indirectly because we never actually see it. We infer that it was disappearing. Well, they're very difficult experiments, and it might take more time. There's a lot of background to try and understand. Their haystack's a bit difficult to understand. And also, each experiment um, is set up for a particular kind of energy to look for, a different particular kind of mass. So maybe with more improvements, we'll be able to see something. Yeah, sorry, time for your question now, then. What makes you believe in supersymmetry? <laughs> Belief. Um, I, th <laughs> I mean, it, it's like I said, there's... Um, there's a really long, very successful history in particle physics of introducing a new particle where we don't understand something. It happened with um, the muon, it happened with the tau, the top, um, the w and zs that were discovered in the 70s, and it happened with the higgs as well. So because we don't understand this huge range of energies that something could be, we think that there's something new, new particles that are trying, uh, that were there in the early universe that can try and fill in some of the holes of our knowledge. Now, whether that's supersymmetry or not, I, I'm not completely convinced, but supersymmetry offers a really good way to search for it. Essentially, it just offers us a really rich array of particles, but also it naturally provides a lot of answers to the standard model, like your dark matter particle. If it's there, it makes a lot of the... the it um, helps the forces actually unify at very high energies as well. It ticks a lot of boxes for me but I want to see it before I, I claim that I believe. Does it, um, uh, does it fit with uh, string theory? Oh, string theory is... String theory is even sub, 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 sub particle levy, level. String theory is the sort of pure theoretical thing up here. Unfortunately, with string theory, there's, they make, there's nothing there's very few things that they predict that we can look for that makes us say string theory is great, it, it works. It's not experimentally uh, very good. And I'm an experimentalist, so I want to look for things that I can detect and I can see and that might turn up at the LHC. So string theory is like a higher, one step above supersymmetry. But it does, I think, a lot of things fit. Yeah. Question here. It would. Uh, it depends if it annihilated with something. Then we'd have a little flash of light. But usually, yeah, you get a, a current change. That's what most of our detectors are actually built out of. Basically, tubes with a wire inside and inert gas, and then we detect the ionization and the charge is read out. You said that the, the current theory is that 27% of missing uh, dark matter is this neutralino thing. Is there no idea whatsoever in physics theory as to what the dark energy might actually be? Really outside my realms. <laughs> um, I think that there's a few things, but I mean, it's... At the moment, it, it's quite mathematical. Um, 
and there's very there's very few things. I, mean, I think there's some supernova experiments that try and understand things, but th there's not as much uh, as many predictions and deep understanding as for something like dark matter. In a way, you can you can think of the fact that everything has a mass as a way of the Higgs field being there. So, if you were measuring everything as massless, you would essentially have the Higgs field. But the fact that everything has mass, it's there. And then one another way is the the boson that we've discovered is. So every, every particle can be considered a wave, and every wave can be considered as a particle. So it's just the, the particle of that field, essentially. And that's what we've seen. So could it be linked with gravity? Not yet. <laughs> that's way, way higher up in the energies that we know. So we can't, at the moment, uh, resolve particle physics and gravity until you get to super high energies and, and theories. So maybe supersymmetry or something like supersymmetry could be a step towards it. Okay, we have another question from the, from the top there. Now we're back to the Higgs I see what you mean, you constructive and destructive things through the universe from the Higgs mass. Um, I think because we're talking about things on such a small scale, like we don't see that kind of thing across the universe. I mean, it's a bit outside of my knowledge, but I mean, <laughs> you, you could certainly have that. But considering how difficult things like the Higgs particles have been to discover, and even just, we haven't seen it, we've seen its decay products and inferred that it was there. Uh, it would be a very difficult thing to try and prove. If you consider it, there was perhaps like more Higgs in one area than the other. Particles would have, could have more. You might see electrons with a, maybe a different mass if they haven't interacted with so many Higgs in one area than the other, perhaps. Just thinking about it now. Yeah, so I mean, the searches are going on for the extra dimensions as well, and we still haven't seen anything yet, so they set limits on the size of, of how they could be. When we, so when we ramp up the LHC, we'll take data for hopefully a good year and give us a good data set. And it really it depends on how fast we can work, how fast we can understand our detector at these really high energies, how fast we can process the data, how fast we can understand the standard model. And then it's also getting the results out of this huge collaboration because everybody has to sign off. So with the Higgs, we started having um, hints of it uh, I think I saw my first plot in April of now, what are we on, 2012. And then by the time the whole data set was processed and the results were completely verified, because you have to verify them not just within Atlas, but with CMS as well, that they were seeing the same thing, that was uh, June the 4th. So it all came together over a couple of months. And in June, I think we'd only finished taking data for a matter of weeks before we got things out. So because the collaboration is so huge and when we find something we don't like to sleep, things can happen really, really quickly. Okay, thanks very much. I think um, uh, uh, we've uh, made Tina work uh, very hard. Um, she'll, of course, be happy to take questions if you go up to her afterwards. Um, but before we um, uh, break up, I've just got a couple of uh, announcements to make. Uh, the next IOP lecture will be on 
Tuesday the uh, 10th of December um, and there are some uh, leaflets here which are welcome to help yourself to. Um, it's Dr. Joe Barstow of the University of Oxford talking about atmospheres on other worlds. Um, if you would like to be on the mailing list for these events uh, and are not already on the mailing list, please feel free to sign up here uh, at, the, at the front desk. Um, anything else? Uh, there's tea and coffee and biscuits waiting outside, but before you make a dash for the exits, let's thank Tina again. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>